we don't enter the world with a clean hard drive. There's, there's an operating system, to use a computer analogy, already in place, one that contains the fallout from the traumas of our parents and grandparents. And here we are born with fears and feelings that don't always belong to us. Why is this? Greetings and welcome, my friends. I'm thrilled to have Mark Wool in with us today to explore breaking the cycle of inherited trauma. By the end of this session, you'll have a greater understanding of how trauma is passed from one generation to the next, the scientific research behind inherited family trauma, the signs and symptoms of, in of inherited trauma, and how to break the cycle. He will also lead us through a powerful practice called integrating our fragmented selves. Mark Wolin is the director of the Family Constellation Institute in San Francisco and is a leading expert in the field of inherited family trauma. He lectures at hospitals, clinics, conferences, universities, and teaching centers around the world. A very grateful welcome, Mark. I'm so happy to have you with us today. Thank you for having me, Jeffrey. I'm happy to be here. Our pleasure. So I'm here to talk with you today about the unexplained symptoms that we inherit, the fears, the anxieties, the obsessive thoughts that we've biologically inherited from our parents and grandparents, symptoms we think are ours. But before I do that, I'd like to share the story of a 16-year-old boy with a rare neurological disorder. When he was 10 years old, he began experiencing intense burning sensations on his skin and the doctors couldn't figure out why this was happening. They, could, they couldn't find any root cause. When I spoke to his mother, she told me about a trauma his father experienced when he was 10. The father was playing with matches and accidentally set the garage on fire and burned the house down. The father's brother died in the fire and the father never forgave himself. And because the trauma remained unhealed and unresolved, the man's son expressed symptoms, burning sensations on his skin at the same age. The family never made the connection. And then after working together, the boy's symptoms subsided. So his story is not unlike many of the stories we carry. The suffering of the past was living in the present. The latest research tells us we can be born into these feelings. As infants, we don't enter the world with a clean hard drive. There's, there's an operating system, to use a computer analogy, already in place, one that contains the fallout from the traumas of our parents and grandparents. And here we are born with fears and feelings that don't always belong to us. Why is this? For that, we have to look at the science. When a, when a trauma happens, it changes us. Literally, it causes a chemical change in our DNA. And this can change the way our genes function, sometimes for generations. Technically, a chemical tag attaches to, to our DNA and tells the cell to use or ignore certain genes, enabling us to better deal with this trauma that just happened. And then the way our genes are affected changes how we act or feel. For example, we, we can become sensitive or reactive to situations that are similar to an original trauma, even if that trauma occurred in a past generation. So we have a better chance of surviving it in this generation. I'll give you an example. If our grandparents come from a war-torn country, Let's say there's bombs going off, bullets flying, uh, uniformed men 
lining people up in the square, people being taken away, people being shot. Our grandparents could pass forward a skill set, sharper reflexes, quicker reaction times, reactions to the violence they experience to help us survive the trauma that they experienced. The problem is we could also inherit a stress response with the dials set to 10, prepare it, and here we are prepared for a catastrophe that never arrives. And we rarely make the link that our anxiety, our hypervigilance, our depression is connected to our parents and grandparents. We just think we're wired this way. And these gene changes, as we're now learning, can be transmitted to our children and to our children's children. Scientists had long suspected something like this was happening, but it wasn't until about 15 years ago that a neuroscientist named Rachel Yehuda from Mount Sinai Medical School yeah. discovered that the children of Holocaust survivors were born with the same trauma symptoms as their parents, specifically the low levels of cortisol, the stress hormone that gets us back to normal after a stressful event. And she also found a similar pattern in children born to mothers who were at or near the World Trade Center when it was attacked during 9-11. If the mothers went on to develop PTSD, the child developed PTSD. In fact, the babies in utero were smaller for their gestational age, and they had 16 different genes that expressed differently than children who weren't affected. About four years ago, Yehuda found that traumatized survivors, traumatized survivors and their children shared the exact same gene changes in the exact same region of the very same gene. She was looking at the FKBP5 gene, a, a gene involved in stress regulation and depressive disorders. She tells us that you and I are three times more likely to have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder if one of our parents had PTSD, just one of our parents. And as a result, we're more likely to struggle with anxiety and depression. Now these patterns can be observed in humans for two generations, but studies with mice show that they can be observed for three or more generations. Humans and mice share a similar genetic makeup over 90%, 92, 93% of the genes in humans have counterparts in mice with over 80% of the genes being identical. Plus you can get uh, a generation in mice in 12 to 20 weeks where it takes 12 to 20 years to get a generation in humans. Uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you one of my favorite studies. So in one study, at Emory Medical School in Atlanta. Male mice were made to fear a cherry blossom-like scent. Every time they smelled the scent, they were shocked. And the researchers noticed changes right there in that first generation that was shocked, changes in the blood, changes in the sperm, changes in the brain. In fact, in the brain, they had enlarged areas where there existed a greater amount of smell receptors. So the mice could detect the scent at lesser concentrations. Their brains had epigen epigenetically adapted to protect them. So the researchers had an idea. What would happen if we impregnated some females who weren't shocked with this male sperm? And the amazing thing is what happened in the second and third generation. The pups and the grandpups became jumpy and jittery just by smelling the smell. In other words, they inherited the stress response without directly experiencing the trauma. So right. one of the most replicated studies in all of epigenetics is separating baby mice from their mothers and then observing the effects for three generations. Um, I'll read you uh, a four line passage from my book. I don't wanna change the words um, here. Uh, in one study, Researchers prevented females from nurturing their pups for up to three hours a day for the first two weeks of life. That's all. Later in life, their offspring 
their offspring exhibited behaviors similar to what we call depression in humans. The symptoms seemed to worsen as the mice aged. Surprisingly, some of the male mice did not express the beha these behaviors themselves, but appeared to epigenetically transmit the behavioral changes to their female offspring. And that would be like fathers going off to war and coming back numb uh, from the trauma and their daughters carrying their father's fight or flight or freeze response, his shaking, his terror, his shutdown. And it's not just fathers and daughters. Inherited trauma, unfortunately, is an equal opportunity employer. Male children and female children are equally impacted by a mother or father's trauma. So that new studies are released practically every week. And I list them on my Facebook page. In fact, I just put one there the last night. Um, uh, but, but I'll tell you two studies, um, recent studies. There, there's a recent study in the Journal of American Medicine Psychiatry, JAMA Psychiatry, that followed mothers who suffered trauma as children and found that their daughters were more likely to struggle with depression and bipolar disorder. And then a recent Tufts University study found that men who suffered trauma as children were able to pass their anxiety onto their children through their sperm. What was significant about the study, it was the first study that showed that human sperm mirrored the same changes, the same non-coding RNA changes that were found in mice that were traumatized as pups. So, so again, let's take a quick look at the science again. RNA, which is copied from DNA, acts as a messenger to instruct the cell's ribosomes to produce specific proteins. But cells also contain small non-coding RNAs that don't produce proteins, that piggyback on the messenger RNA, interfering with or amplifying their function, causing more or less of certain proteins to be produced, affecting which genes get actively expressed. Now, one of the researchers I like a lot, he's doing some fascinating work right now with both humans and mice, is a woman, a researcher named Isabel Monsui at the Brain Research Institute at the University of Zurich. In one of her studies with mice, baby mice were separated from their mothers and or their mothers were traumatized, stressed out, and then returned to the babies. And these mice went on to show behaviors of depression and despair. So she took these mice um, that either were separated from their moms or brought had stressed out mums brought back to them, and she drops them in a bowl of water. Now, the mice who weren't traumatized are swimming around the bowl trying to get out, trying to escape. But the depressed mice would hardly swim at all. They'd float and eventually drown. Their, their brain cells and sperm cells showed aberrant DNA methylation, which is another epigenetic mechanism, as well as an excess number of small non-coding RNAs. So the researchers, again, had an idea. What if we take and extract some of this RNA, these RNA sperm cells and inject them into the fertilized eggs of female mice, and they noticed the same behavior in the pups and the grand pups. They would float and eventually drown. In other words, the freeze response was carried for three generations. Now, Isabel Monsui, she's recently been examining the blood samples of survivors from that uh, 2015 terror attack in Nice, where that guy drove that white van in the promenade and killed 80 people. And she's looking at the blood of the survivors, and she found correlations in the blood of the survivors and her traumatized mice. She's also been looking at the blood samples of Pakistani orphans who've experienced chaotic early years, similar to the mice in her lab that have, un, that have had unpredictable separations from their mothers. And she found similar non-coding RNA alterations, basically similar biomarkers in, in mice and in children. Mm. So, so epigenetics, look, it's just one piece of the puzzle. Embryologists have known for a hundred years that when grandma 
was five months pregnant with our mother. The egg that will one day become us was already present in, in, in our mother's womb, who's already in grandma's womb. And when you pair that work with Bruce Lipton's work, who says that a mother's emotions can be chemically communicated to the, fena, the, to the fetus through the placenta, biochemically altering the genetic expression, the implications are huge. Look, when, when we work with trauma, really the question is, whose trauma? Whose trauma are we working with? We really don't know until we peel back the layers and do some investigative work, do a genogram, a traumagram, look at the events in the family history. And perhaps the bigger question right now, um, how do you and I know, how do we know if we're carrying the effects of inherited family trauma.